Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the foundation for the uh, invitation. Uh, I lived uh, in Princeton for four years and I uh, used to taking a New Jersey transit to visit uh, New York quite often, so I'm glad to be back here. Uh, so today uh, I'd like to tell you about the uh, cosmic micro background. And uh, there's a little uh, satellite which is up here uh, on the screen. So this is the Wilkins Microwave and Isotropy Probe Satellite. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, what we learned uh, by using the data that came from this wonderful satellite. So, oh, it moves. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, this is probably a very, very obvious thing, but I have to say this, because sometimes we all get confused. Even professional astronomers get confused about what we're doing. You know, what are the assumptions? What do we actually know for sure? So, it is true that astronomers, so, I call myself astronomers. Astronomers often talk about things as if we're there to see it. You know, stars, burn hydrogen, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the story is told by astronomers are often remarkable. But aren't they just imaginations? Aren't we just theorizing things and no evidence for it whatsoever? Some of them are, in fact, pure imaginations. Some of them are based on the data. But we have to be very clear about what we actually speculate about and what we already know. So I hope that one of the goals of my presentation today is to clarify that fine line. Well, what do we actually know by now and what we are willing to speculate? So first of all, we're not really making stuff up. So I'm going to tell you about how the universe might have begun and what kind of evidence do we have for that? And, and some of the things I'm going to tell you are just frankly really, really amazing. And, uh, and it's, you know, as a professional astronomer and cosmologist, I sort of still get amazed by what, uh, for example, this little satellite has given to us. But they are not made up. And I will tell you when I will start making things up. <laughs> so, uh, so goal of my presentation is to show you how we're actually seeing the early universe. True, we're not there, we weren't there, but we can see them by powerful, powerful telescopes. We're collecting these photons coming from the fireball universe every day. And they're around us, many of them. So first of all, for the first 45 minutes, you'll be hearing the things that we know for sure. There's not really a question about whether I'm going to tell you is correct or, or not correct. So you can relax, because I know that uh, you know, some talks which don't distinguish between what we speculate and what we don't speculate, all these get confused, and what should we believe really here? So for the first 45 minutes, you don't have to worry about that. Everything I'll tell you is based upon the precision data, and I will show you the data as well to convince you. For the uh, rest of the time, I'll speculate. So I will tell you when I will go from everything I told you was correct, uh, phase to most of the stuff I'll now tell you is a speculation. Okay. Uh, so let's watch some movie. Uh, so this is uh, a DVD created for IMAX theater. It's called Cosmic Voyage. It's narrated by Morgan Freeman. And this is a wonderful uh, uh, DVD uh, movie. But the one thing I wanted to tell you is that, in fact, this is not really based upon any scientific computing. It's really. Uh, artist uh, illustration, but surprisingly accurate. And uh, in essence, really, uh, so once again, first of all, this is not really scientific, scientific data, but uh, I can tell you that the, what you're going to see here is very accurate representation of what we know uh, based upon the data we have collected. So let me just push the button. Uh, so uh, universe expands and then uh, cools down. Now, uh, there are two things I wanted to take away from this uh, movie here, first of all, so universe was very opaque. So we all hear that uh, universe was once dense and hot. The consequence of that is in fact very important. Universe at certain point was very, very opaque. Just like in the fog, you have water, vapor, molecules, scattering light. Here, uh, it's a plasma, and electrons are very good at the scattering light. So you can't see. 
it's very opaque. But once temperature goes down to uh, 3,000 kelvins, then universe becomes transparent. Another thing I want to show you, uh, I want to emphasize is that the universe back then is really lumpy. It's not really homogeneous. It's full of uh, st structures already, and that's very important. Now universe has become transparent. Now you can start seeing through the universe. This is the time that the universe was 3,000 kelvins, and then our uh, age of the universe was about 380,000 years old. Because present day age is the 13.7 uh, or 13.8 billion years, uh, 380,000 years old is really a baby picture. Now we're collecting photons that came from the uh, moment when the universe became transparent. Now, um, there were lots of structures already, and now these little structures start to collide with each other, and they form bigger and bigger and bigger things. And they grow at certain points so big that they become a Milky Way. They become an Andromeda galaxy in which we will be born. But the still, the universe is quite young, and uh, these little lumps are not big enough to become a galaxy, but they just keep colliding, colliding, colliding. But all of these structures we see, we see in the universe, you know, lots of galaxies, lots of clusters of galaxies, they all originated from these tiny fluctuations that existed already before the universe became transparent. So in, 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 in a way, universe knew where to form Milky Way, where to form solar system, where to form us when it was born. So that sounds really spectacular, and I'm going to basically show you why we think so, based upon the uh, precision data. Now, uh, fireball universe, it was very hot and dense. Now, uh, I wanted to warn you that uh, when I have a dot like that, I don't really mean that the universe has a dot before. I don't say that. Space can be infinitely big. Could be finite, but really big, much bigger than the size of the dot here. That's why here, on the vertical axis, I say space without any boundary. So what I'm going to do is just take one dot in space, which is full of hot photons. After all, there's no way we can tell the size of the universe. Light has a finite velocity, and age of the universe is finite. So there's a finite size that we can ever see. We don't really have any information beyond that unless we're just willing to speculate. But there's no way you can tell if there's any, anything that's special outside of our so-called visible horizon. So basically, our universe, which is just a tiny part of the entire universe, was hot and dense in the past, cools down as it expands. And I hope that in this picture, it is clear that the photons that filled the array of higher volumes before didn't go anywhere. They're still with us. They're just floating around. And as space stretches by the expansion of the universe, wavelength of light gets stretched, so photon cools. Basically, uh, as the universe expands, space uh, expands, and then photons cool down. They lose energy. They lose energy so much that um, they are now in microwave re region. You can't see them by eyes. When the temperature of the universe was 3,000 kelvins, it's only half of the temperature of the surface of the sun. So you can definitely see those photons by eyes. But the universe since then has expanded by a factor of thousands. Wavelength then gets stretched by a factor of a thousand. So you have to imagine that you see the sunlight, but then you multiply the wavelength of the sun by 1,000, and you are in the millimeter region. Wavelength is a millimeter. Now, you can collect those photons by basically using radio technology. And what we learned was there are 410 photons per cubic centimeter coming from the fireball universe. There are the most numerous particles in the universe. They are everywhere. They are our friends. We are surrounded by these photons as we speak now. Cubic centimeter, 400 photons. 
So this is my friend, Dr. Helenia Paris. So, so uh, she uh, studied under Professor uh, David Spurgel here. So really, all you need to do is to detect radio waves, and you know how to do it. Take a radio. Take this old-fashioned TV that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, or use a cell phone. Uh, just pick up something, some device, that can tell you how much uh, radio signal is in space. And Professor uh, Dave Wilkinson, uh, Princeton University, uh, he used to say that the 1% of this noise in the old TV is coming from Fireball Universe. Isn't that remarkable? So you don't really have to do anything. You just have to pick up a radio and listen to the noise. You don't tune to the radio frequency that actually broadcasts the uh, program because that, that overwhelms the signals from the uh, Fireball Universe. You just tune somewhere in between, listen to it. You are listening to the noise from the Fireball Universe. And I'm not making stuff up. This is the truth. <laughs> I told you that uh, this is something remarkable that's really true. Now, this is the sky in the visible light. And if, for example, Google made Google Glasses, and let's say Apple perhaps makes Apple Glasses someday too, and uh, let's imagine that for whatever reasons, uh, non-commercial reasons, they wanted to uh, have a glasses that are sensitive to millimeter wavelength, microwaves. Then, with that glass, you see that sky. So everywhere you look, it's photons from the Fireball Universe. So light from the Fireball Universe fitting the sky, but you can't see them by eye. You have to tune to millimeter. This is the microwave frequency, hence we call this the cosmic microwave background. And temperature of that is 2.7 Kelvin in absolute temperature. It's very, very cold. Okay. Uh, now, 1965, uh, 50 years ago. So this year is the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the discovery of the cosmic micro background. And there will be a dedicated conference on this in the Princeton University in June. And Princeton is the place where one of the first experiments discovering this was conducted. So of course, that's the, basically the, uh, the holy place <laughs> for CM researchers, if I not using this word incorrectly. Um, but this is not Princeton University. So this is the uh, um, Bell Lab in Homedale, New Jersey. And there are two gentlemen who just got a PhD in astronomy. But they went to Bell Lab, and Bell Lab is famous for spending a fraction of the funding into whatever that's exciting at the moment. Not necessarily connected to the communication uh, technologies that are specialized in. Now look at this telescope. This is a radio telescope. This is a six feet big telescope, it's a huge thing. Was not developed for radio astronomy at all. This was developed for the first ever world, uh, uh, first uh, ever communication satellite project called ECHO. And some of you may or, uh, still remember the, the time when th there was a, a TV broadcast from Paris to New York by this uh, I think that was Telstra, the, the successor of ECHO, but ECHO was the first communication satellite. So when satellite uh, received the radio signal from, let's say, Paris, and then sent it back to down to New York or New Jersey, that's the telescope that did it. This is the radio receiver that detected that uh, signal from the uh, telescope, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the communication satellite. But once that Telstra project is over, now this telescope is made available to these two young gentlemen, radio astronomers. They're very excited about using this to measure the uh, radio brightness of supernova remnant called Cassiopeia A. But in order to uh, know how bright this Cassiopeia A is, uh, you have to somehow know the, uh, you have to use something that you know the temperature of. So you compare some stuff that you make and with a known temperature to the, the signal you see from the sky. By comparison, you can tell how bright the object is. That's the idea. Now, if you go to Deutsche Museum, this German museum for science and technology, the largest in the world, you see this 1 to 25 model of uh, 
pin just moves on to this bit of antenna. This thing moves. It's fully functional. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah? So this is what they used. And this is the real back-end system. This is the real detector system of Penjas Wilson experiment. This is what recorded cosmic micro background, the real stuff. Uh, Dr. Penjas was born in Munich, and he kindly donated this to Deutsche Museum. So if you ever had a chance to go to Deutsche Museum, go to the third floor. But the third floor has this gigantic uh, exhibition for astro astronomy. But the, this thing is in a staircase. So you have to go outside the room <laughs> and find this. And, and I, I just realized that when I was preparing for this slide, I'm actually here in shadow. So I'm actually <laughs> So I'm here. And uh, here's my wife <laughs> next to me. I was very, very excited. Uh, so the way it works is that you have this gigantic six-speed antenna. Then you, this light is going into this horn antenna, this one called horn antenna. Then goes into the uh, amplifier because signal from the sky is so faint. You have to amplify it. That the amplifier signal will then move the uh, the uh, recorder. Very very simple design. This is basically what you do when you make a radio. The difference though is that it has this something called a calibrator with a known temperature, and it's five Kelvin, extremely cold. So this is too expensive to put into the radio. radio and you don't really need it anyway. The signal is big enough. But what you basically do is to compare the sky signal and this stuff, the 5 Kelvin, the pens just made, and then see how hot or cool, cold the sky is. Now, as soon as they turned on the apparatus, they discovered CMB. Because they didn't know it at that time, but it didn't take them more than five minutes to to realize that, that there was a problem. So uh, as you go to down, the, the, uh, as you go down, it's a time series. So if you so up is earlier time, the down is later time. As you go to the right, the voltage, so you have the uh, bigger signal. And as you go to the left, you have the uh, smaller signal. Now you see that this there is a dip in, in, uh, in the middle, and, it, and you can't probably see it, but it's say C O L D, it's cold. Right? There's a dip here. It, so this, the 5 Kelvin stuff that the pen just made is called cold load, something that's cold. So when you switch your uh, input to the cold load, then there's a dip in the signal because it's very, very cold. Now you switch to the sky, and you start seeing the brighter, the stronger signal. That turns out to be 6.7 Kelvin. Penjas Wilson experiment and also a bunch of other people already knew how cold the atmosphere is. Atmosphere also emits radio signal. That's known to be 2.7 Kelvin. Antenna also emits something. You know, when you heat up something, it emits something. So antenna also uh, radiates, but that's measured to be 0.8 Kelvin. Everything else is bounded to be below 0.1 Kelvin. Now you just do subtraction. 6.7 minus 2.3 minus 0.8 minus 0.1 is 3.5. It's not zero. And they couldn't understand why it wasn't zero. Now, if you look at these data points, it is clear that the signal is booming. And you see some jagged thing in the bottom of the, uh, the uh, diagram, say, you, you look at the cold. Right? There's a signal di dip here, but if you look at the uh, sort of fluctuations in the data, recording data, it's tiny, tiny. It's a statistically extremely precise measurement. But error of here is 1.0. The 3.5 plus minus 1.0 Kelvin, this error of is entirely due to so-called systematic error, namely, how well do we know the atmosphere, the temperature of the atom atmosphere? How do we know the temperature that the antenna emits. How do we know everything else that's out there? So this 3.5 Kelvin was just too large to be accounted for by anything that they knew at that time. So data were taken on May 20th. Paper was published in May 1965. So it took them a year 
to figure out what could, what, what it could have been. So there's a long story about this. I don't have time to go into this. But basically, long story short, they called Princeton University. And the professor, Robert Dicke, who thought that universe has to be filled with this uh, photons from the fireable universe. He thought that the universe back then must have been very hot and dense. Very brilliant idea. Could be completely crazy, but data suggested that he was right. Now here is the, uh, the data. So uh, vertical axis is brightness of this cosmic micro background. Uh, horizontal axis is wavelength. And Penges and Wilson experiment detect the signal as seven centimeters. So somewhere in the middle, I think that's the one of the uh, green, green dots. Then uh, Princeton University group, Dave Wilkinson, made the, the second measurement in the cosmic micro background. And that data point is at three centimeters. So this, and, and again, one of the uh, green dots. The thing is that a bunch of experiments were undertaken, but most notably, there was a COBE satellite that was launched in 1989, so NASA's satellite, which made incredibly precise measurement, which is shown in blue. Now, what's remarkable about this data? First of all, they are extremely precise. Okay? But these data points can be described by one parameter, a temperature, nothing else. So this yellow curve is a, a two Kelvin, a black body spectrum, so-called, or Planck spectrum. I will tell you what that is later. Magenta is four Kelvin. So it's not four Kelvin, it's not two Kelvin, it's 2.725 Kelvin. And as far as you can tell, there's no deviation from this curve. One second, which depends only on one variable. And this one variable can explain all the data points which are extremely precise. So there's something going on here, and what is this Planck spectrum anyway? So this Planck spectrum is the proof that the universe was fireable before. This Planck spectrum is achieved only when matter and radiation are exchanging energies frequently and reaching so-called thermal equilibrium. Now this Max Planck is the uh, the name is now in this Max Planck Institute for, Institute for Astrophysics that I'm, I'm in. So he's a renowned physicist who basically uh, gave birth to uh, uh, quantum mechanics. But the uh, motivation that led to Planck spectrum is quite remarkable. The prime minister, Bismarck, ion prime minister, he thought that ion is the most important thing. So he hired a bunch of meisters, these specialists, who can tell the temperature of the ion by looking at the color of the fire. But Bismarck wanted to do something better. So he asked Max Planck to, can you please come up with some idea to make this temperature measurement more precise? Because in order to melt the ion, you have to have like 1,000, 1,500 kelvins. Then Planck realized that uh, a, a, a matter which is in thermal equilibrium with radiation emits very special kind of spectrum that I showed before, it's called Planck spectrum. If you can measure this, you can determine temperature scientifically. You no longer have to rely on Meisters. So they lost jobs. Uh, but clearly, Current universe isn't in thermal equilibrium, otherwise we die. We're not talking about this thing here. So today's universe is not thermal equilibrium, which means universe in the past was in thermal equilibrium. And we're basically seeing these photons coming from those eras. That's the scientific proof. And look at this precision of data, it's amazing. There's no doubt that these photons came from this fireball universe. And once again, per cubic centimeter, there are 410 of those photons. They're everywhere. So origin of cosmic micro background, uh, uran universe was hotter than 3,000 kelvins. Matter was completely ionized, and universe was filled with plasma, which behaves just like a soup. This soup consists of protons, electrons, and helium nuclei, photons, and neutrinos, and dark matter. 
Now, uh, dark matter is something we can't see, but uh, it turns out that 80% uh, of the mass in the matter in the whole universe is made of something called dark matter that we don't know what, what that is, but it, it exists. And uh, the ordinary matter are only 20% uh, in mass. So basically what happens is that we have the ball soup. So there's soup made of protons and blah, blah, blah. Then this dark matter provides something called gravitational potential. So essentially holds soup together. So you have a soup ball provided by dark matter inside of which you have this rapidly uh, scattering electrons and photons and protons. So now I say this as an analogy, but it turns out that the math that describes this system is basically the same to the system of soup uh, held together by dark matter. So here's a proton. Proton is shown bigger because its mass is 2,000 times bigger than electrons. Helium consists of two protons and two neutrons, and they are photons. These are waves. And when temperature of the universe was hotter than 3,000 kelvins, electrons are stripped away from protons. And they constantly scatter photons. Electrons are also scattered by protons and helium nuclei by so-called Coulomb scattering. The electrons scatter photons by so-called Thomson scattering. But the bottom line here is that the photons just can't go freely. They mess around with electrons until the universe cools down to 3,000 kelvins. Once the uh, universe cools down to 3,000 kelvins, electrons are now combined in, into uh, protons forming neutral hydrogen. Now, in fact, neutral hydrogen atoms do scatter photons by so-called radius scattering, but the radius scattering's efficiency is much lower than Thomson scattering, hence, to good approximation, you can say that the universe basically became transparent, and then photons after that, will not undergo extra scatterings. They do some, but not a, not a lot. That's the reason why you can see these photons. And remember the uh, photograph. W when you take a photograph of me, why can't you actually take the photograph? That's simply because light from this, uh, photons from this light get scattered off my body, or I absorb it and re-emit it. So you see lots of scattered photons from me. Exactly the same here. You see the photons that are last scattered by electrons when temperature of the universe was 3,000 kelvins. So when we take the photograph, when we collect photons coming from this era, literally, we are taking a digital camera photo of the universe when it was 380,000 years old. And once again, I'm not making stuff up. This is the fact. So, 2001, NASA launched this Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe Satellite. And uh, uh, David, Professor David Spargo here is the uh, member of this, and also uh, Dr. Michele Limon, uh, he's at uh, Columbia University, uh, he's here as well. So uh, I really appreciate your presence here. So this satellite, oh, and uh, uh, we used to be younger. <laughs> And uh, you see Professor Spargo here, I'm here, and then uh, you saw uh, Dr. Uh, Piranha Paris uh, before. Uh, he, he was hold she was holding this TV. Yeah? Uh, so about 20 people, team. Now, uh, we live in a uh, Milky Way, and uh, we live on the uh, Earth, now, we see sky from the point of view of the Earth, obviously. So we are surrounded by sky 360 degrees, but we wanted to show this on the piece of paper. So we expand this around. And this is so-called galactic projection. It's the motorway projection in galactic coordinates. What you see on the plane is a galactic plane. As you go to the above, it's galactic north pole. That bottom is a galactic south pole. And two dots you see on the uh, bottom right corner is a Magellanic Clouds that you can't see from Northern Hemisphere, but if you go to Australia, you can see them. Now, I'm going to increase the wavelength. As soon as I click on this, you start seeing the universe that you can't see by visible light. So already, these are not visible to your eyes. But you have to use specialized devices that are sensitive to infrared. Uh, you know, they're taking photograph of us at the airport using this infrared camera. Uh, then, if 
far infrared, so something that warms you up. Uh, universe is also full of warm stuff, so they emit right in, uh, light in far infrared. Oops, uh, too, too, too quickly. Uh, yes, sorry about that. Um, so we were in the far infrared. Yeah. Then some millimeter, now you start seeing the radiation coming from the cold molecules in, in space. Then by the time you go to millimeter, microwave, sky looks like that. Everywhere you look, you see light from the fire of the universe. Okay? This is the real data. No making stuff up. Now if you then improve your sensitivity, you, know, you, you, you create a better camera, and then uh, increase the sensitivity by a factor of 100,000, so a lot. Yeah? Then you, are, you, start seeing, you start seeing fluctuations. So these are the fluctuations that you saw at the beginning in the movie. And these ripples were there already when the universe was pretty much you know, right after the universe was born. This is the real data. So we took data by this, by sending two parabola antennas to space. Now, why do you need two parabola antennas? We want to take a difference between uh, temperatures in the sky. Now, let's imagine that you do Penzias Wilson experiment. You devise five Kelvin cold load and compare the sky temperature with that cold load at one time, in one direction. Five minutes later, you move your telescope to the other direction and re-measure it. Assuming everything is fixed, it doesn't depend on time, didn't change, didn't change over time, the difference between temperatures you recorded will be the difference in the temperature in the sky. But of course, in real life, everything changes. Temperature of cold load may change, by, using, by changing antenna direction, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric temperature changes. Everything changes. So how can you be sure that you are recording the difference in the sky rather than difference in the instrument? Very clever idea, which was used uh, to detect this anisotopy for the first time, was to take a difference. So basically, you have two lines of sight you observe simultaneously and then differentiate the, the outputs. Then you know that you're taking the signals differences at the same time. So, so unless sky is inhomogeneous, so temperatures in the sky are different, you see no signal. Okay? If everything is the same in the sky, you shouldn't see any signal when you differentiate. So you can be sure that when you see sun, signal in the sky, uh, when, you see, when you have some temperature differences in the sky, you, you record it. Okay? And by repeating this over the whole sky, this is the picture we created. This tells you the hot regions are, sorry, the red regions are hot. So temperature there is about 70 microkelvin hotter than the average. Blue regions about 70 microkelvin colder than the average. Very, very small irregularity, but it's there. Now, because matter and uh, photons were in thermal equilibrium, when you see change differences in temperature, you also have differences in amounts of matter there. So what you see here is, in fact, the matter distribution right after the universe was born. Okay. Um, but it so happens that the cold spots are the place where you have more matter. Because when you, so you might think that, uh, okay, when you have more matter, there must be more photons, hence temperature has to be higher, which is in fact true. But once the universe became transparent, photons now escape from this gravitational potential. As photons escape from this region that has more matter, they lose energy. And so happens that the energy they lose by climbing up against the potential well, hence escaping the overdense regions, is more greater than the energy that had at the bottom of the potential well. So 
when you look into one of the cold spots, you have more matter. And now, this matter attracts more matter into it and grows in size and in amplitude due to gravitational attraction. They eventually form stars. They eventually form galaxies. They eventually form planets. They eventually form us. So what WMAP taught us with this high precision measurement is that that's our origin. So we nailed our origin to one of the ripples that existed when the universe was 380,000 years old. Not bad, okay? That's as far as we could go directly. So that's pretty remarkable. And we know this is true for sure. Okay. Do you know what this is? <laughs> this is miso soup and tofu, yes. So I told you that the universe is like a miso soup. And uh, so think of the miso soup and imagine throwing tofu into a miso soup. And of course, my mother will be very upset. But just imagine you're doing that anyway. And then just imagine you're doing that while changing the density of miso. And you see, you watch how ripples are created in miso soup and propagate throughout the uh, soup bowl. My mother will be very worried, but uh, I'll do that anyway. Then you might see this. Different miso soups with different density of miso. Some ripples last longer, some, people, some ripples don't last. So you can tell how much miso you have. And perhaps you have something else in the miso as well. And that's what we see. And it sounds like crazy. But if you look at the math that describes cosmic micro background, it's identical to the physics of miso soup. Okay. So, we now do the data analysis. When we see ripples like that, we wish to decompose the fluctuations you see into a set of waves with various wavelengths. So spatial wavelength, okay? And make a diagram showing the strength of each wavelength. And we see this. And who might have thought that this kind of oscillating pattern was present in this cosmic micro background map? This is the proof that the universe was like a miso soup. And when you drop tohu into it, it propagates. Now, nice thing is that by analyzing this waveform, you can measure composition of the universe. If you don't like miso soup, or you've never seen it before, think about this like, um, and in fact, this is more correct physical, physics analogy. So I, I hit wood, and I hit, say, grasses, or metal, perhaps. Then you hear different sounds, depending on what stuff it's made of, it creates different sound. And your brain does this already. Your brain processes it. Decomposes into set of waves and measure that relative amplitude of different frequencies. And brain will tell you, you just heard wood. We're doing exactly the same thing here, exactly the same. So this quantity is called power spectrum. And let me just visualize. Uh, so when you look at, uh, sorry, I forgot to say something very important. So as you go to the right in this diagram, you, you're looking at uh, smaller structures, so shorter wavelengths, the finer structures. As you go to the left, you're looking at the bigger structures, longer wavelength. And let me just show you this. So when you look at uh, sm the, uh, to, to the uh, far left in this diagram, you're looking at fairly long wavelength, long wavelength fluctuations over the whole sky. In the middle, you see finer structures. And the, uh, basically, the vertical axis of this diagram is the uh, squared amplitude of these uh, waves. Uh, yeah, so just finer, finer structures. Yeah, so 
let me fast forward. Then, after this, you combine them all. Ta-da! That's the data. <laughs> so, this is called Hurry analysis. Thank you, ESA. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the European also launched the satellite called the Planck satellite. That was a successor of the uh, WMAP, and they did a fantastic measurement as well. So all we have to do is to compare this observed waveform to the uh, predicted waveform as a function of things like abundance of hydrogen and helium. And when you change abundance of hydrogen and helium from 1% to 10%, the waveform changes accordingly. We know how to compute this. From this, we can deduce. So by comparing this to the uh, theoretical uh, predictions, we now know that we don't understand 90% of the universe. What a shame. Uh, so it turns out that uh, only 5% of the energy budget in the universe today is something we know, hydrogen and helium. 23% dark matter, we don't know really what that is. Dark energy is even more embarrassing. So uh, we call this dark energy because we know for sure that it's not matter. If it's not matter, what does it do? Uh, we don't really understand it. But the one thing this dark energy does is something that just matter doesn't. So namely, <laughs> uh, matter pulls. Okay? We all learned somewhere that the gravity pulls. But dark energy doesn't. So let's say you have an apple and um, Throw it to throw it, yeah? and of course gravity pulls, so it comes back. Now uh, I have to say that on Earth, Earth is a special location where matter sort of uh, uh, came together. So the amount of matter is very very large compared to the average space position in space. Average position in space has lot lower matter content. There. 70% of the energy is due to dark energy. But here, 100% of, pretty much 100% of the energy density is matter. Hence, matter pulls, apple falls down. But if we pretend that we are sort of in a sort of dark energy dominating case, this is a <laughs> dark energy dominating case, uh, then situation reverses. Uh, and you know, basically, what happens is that uh, you throw an apple, it goes that. And, and there's another one thing that, uh, that this movie doesn't actually capture so much. Uh, by the way, David, uh, this is someone you know very well. This is Professor Sugiyama in Nagoya University. <laughs> this is the NHK TV program that I also helped to create. So, so this apple, although it sort of went up with constant velocity, you might have thought, you know, seen. The real, real situation is that this apple picks up velocity. So it goes up with acceleration. And now, you, it's the moment that you, 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 you will yell at me saying, you are lying. You're surely lying. <laughs> this is completely opposite of everybody heard in their schools, colleges, whatever. And that's true. It's very, very upsetting. But this is true. This is based upon scientific fact, not just WMAP, but anything else you can think of. Any other cosmological astrophysical evidences point toward this happening in the universe. So this is the fact. This is what's happening today. What I'm going to tell you later is that this might be happening in the early universe too. And that's where we start to speculate, but not just yet. Now, who dropped those tohus? <laughs> We understand perfectly well the miso soup. Very good. But who dropped tofus? OK, I did. But you know, for the tofu, miso. But what about universe? Who actually dropped those tofus? That's the very important question. And these two gentlemen played a leading role in that. So uh, Professor Heisenberg, who got PhD from Munich University, was the founder of uh, quantum mechanics and Professor Mukanov, who is currently at Munich University, applied quantum mechanics to the early universe in saying, quantum mechanics was at work in the early universe. And Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that you can borrow energy if you promise to return it in a short 
in, uh, shortly. Like you go to PNC Bank, ask for a million dollars for one hour. They will say no. But if you ask for one million dollar for one second, they might lend it to you and you return it immediately. They, they think you're crazy, but that's OK. Uh, so time was very, very short in the early universe. So you could borrow a lot of energy. And those energies became the origin of fluctuations. And that's what Professor Mukanov said. What a crazy idea. Brilliant, but crazy. And who would on earth believe that? And you have to have tremendous evidence supporting it until, until you believe it. So how can we test such a hypothesis? That everything we see around us, and, and remember that I didn't switch to speculation yet, OK? This is still, this is still the fact. How can we test this hypothesis? We need to show that the properties of CMB that you just saw, the power spectrum, but there's something else other than power spectrum you can use to test this. That's Gauss distribution. So uh, horizontal axis, the values of temperatures measured in the sky minus mean temperature. So the, this distribution centers at zero. So zero is the mean, average temperature. Vertical axis shows you the number of pixels that have that temperature. So there are, the, 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 uh, most of the pixels simply see mean temperature, zero. And as you go to the right, right, or as you go to the left, you are exponentially rare. Okay? So the high temperature regions, low temperature regions, they're exponentially rare. This is a prediction of Gauss distribution. This is a prediction of quantum fluctuations. Quantum mechanics tells you that if quantum mechanics was responsible for generating tofus, it's quantum, quantum tofus, if you like, this is the distribution we should see in the sky. Do we see it? Yes, we do. Look at that. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, I basically made a career doing this. And uh, it's just, just so amazing. And this, I've never seen anything Gaussian like this. Oh, by the way, Gaussian. So this Gaussian this has been so important that it became an adjective, became a noun, and became even a verb. So is this distribution Gaussian? Let's test Gaussianity. <laughs> oh, this distribution is so non-Gaussian. I found a large non-Gaussianity. Let's Gaussianize it. <laughs> okay. Now, what do we do? So, uh, because this Gaussian distribution is symmetric, what we do is to take triple product of temperature and the average of our distribution. So, this P in the equation is a distribution. It's basically a Gaussian distribution. Delta T is a value of temperature minus 2.725 Kelvin. 2.725 Kelvin, yes. You cube it. And the average over distribution it should be zero. Okay? If it's a Gauss distribution, it must be zero to within the experimental uncertainty. If we see non-zero value above experimental uncertainty, you just rule out Gaussianity. Hence, you rule out Professor Mukanov's hypothesis. And we do this not only on the a single location in the sky, but we, we pick up three locations in the sky and do this average many, many times. Then what we learned was that, yes, uh, temperature distribution in the cosmic micro background is Gaussian. You can have non-Gaussianity, but cannot be more than 0.2%. 0.2% from WMAP. ESA's European mission, Planck, improved this uh, limit by factor of 10. Now we're not allowed to have non-Gaussianity at the level of 0.03% or more. And I can guarantee you that this is the most Gaussian thing in the sky. Okay? If you look at anything in the sky, it will be very, very non-Gaussian. So at this point, we have to be convinced. Okay? So CMB, from, from, from this precision measurement of the uh, energy spectrum of uh, CMB, it's, the, uh, it's coming from fireball, period. From this power spectrum, very, very precise measurements, we know the composition of the universe, and we have these embarrassing things like dark energy. From Gaussianity, you have a strong evidence for the quantum origin of all structures we see in the universe. We came from quantum fluctuations. Can you believe that? No. 
<laughs> but it's true. So that's the amazing thing. Yeah? Now, all of these rather remarkable conclusions have been reached by precision data, and we didn't suddenly make any single thing up yet. Now we'll speculate, OK? <laughs> Ready? Um, so missing link. The quantum mechanics is something that governs microscopic, wor microscopic world, atomic world, very, very short distance. Yet, galaxies are very big. So how is it possible that something that's tiny like that influences the microscopic world? And remember, we also have quantum fluctuations if you go to sufficiently small scales. Now, today, in this room, they just don't influence anything microscopic. But somehow in the early universe, it was possible. So what's that mechanism? And here comes the cosmic inflation hypothesis. It says, in a tiny fraction of a second, like 10 to the minus 36 second, 0 0.00001, 1, universe became big by factor of 10 to the 26, so many, many zeros. Basically, in a tiny fraction of a second, something the size of atomic nucleus became the size of the solar system. And if you think it's crazy, I'm fully with you. If one undergraduate or even graduate student came to my office and saying, Professor Komatsu, I have this great idea. I think the universe became a, a big by factor of 10 to the 26 in the 10 to the minus 36 second. And I say to, to them, OK, very well. So go back to your home, study the, a basic physics book from the beginning. But this might be true. We don't know yet. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be amazing if this was true? And we're going to test this. Okay? So once the inflation starts, it stretches the wavelength of everything by exponential amount. So you might be having this small, small wavelength, small, small, uh, small uh, quantum fluctuations. But once the inflation starts, it stretches to macroscopic scales. And that became the seed for the uh, galaxies. Well, you don't have to believe this yet, OK? Because we don't have, we have evidence, but we don't have uh, smoking gun. I hate to use this word. I thought I would never use this, but anyway, I use this anyway. OK, now, coming back to cosmic uh, miso soup. This is the result of throwing quantum tofus into miso soup, cosmic miso soup. We know that the, these wiggles are created by waves. And these waves can be calculated by knowing the density of atoms, density of dark matter, density of dark energy, which we know now very, very well. So why don't we get rid of that? And what we see now is this constant amplitude at all angular scales. So this would be the how, ma how many tohus are dropped on what length scales. Once again, as you go to the right, it's short wavelength. Left is long wavelength. But early universe may not have done this. It could be this. It could be that. right? So let's figure this out. So this amplitude of the wave is proportional to this multiple L to ns minus 1. And if ns is less than 1, it's like this. If it's more than 1, it's like that. Now, why is that a big deal? Inflation does the following. Quantum fluctuations are created. In inflation stretches it. Shortly after, another fluctuation is created. Inflation stretches it. Because the first fluctuation that was stretched had more time to be stretched, they will appear as longer wavelength fluctuations on the sky, namely, if you look at this diagram, the left, as you go to the left, you are seeing fluctuations created earlier. As you go to the right, you see the fluctuations that were created later. Okay? Longer wavelength fluctuations had more time to be stretched. Hence, it's appearing as a lo longer wavelength fluctuations on the sky. Now, I told you that the energy you can borrow is 
is uh, inversely proportional to the time. So as the universe evolves, you have more time, and pressure has to go down. That's the prediction. So Professor Mukanov said, NS is less than 1. In fact, it should be less than 0.97. Okay? And that was 1981. Kobe satellite, in 1992, it discovered these fluctuations in the temperature. It said NS is about 1 to within 10% precision. Since then, for 23 years, what? 20 or so years? Finding an S less than one has been the dream of cosmology. And it was certainly a dream of mine when I was a graduate student. After nine years of observations and data analysis, we got an S 0.97 plus minus 0 0.013. But this is, in a scientific term, so-called 2.5 sigma evidence. Namely, 1 minus an S is 0 0.028. And that's like two and a half times the error bar. That's good evidence, but not definitive evidence. Then you can use a Atacama Cosmology Telescope that David Sp uh, Professor Spargel is, uh, is a, a, a one of the leaders there. So you, you basically, WMAP's uh, parabola antenna was only two and a half meters, uh, sorry, uh, 1.5 meters. So you can't really resolve the finer things. But if you go to the ground, you can't really launch six meter telescope in the space. It's too expensive. But if you on the ground, you can do this. So you go to Chile and build six, six meter uh, telescope just for cosmic micro background. When you go to South Pole telescope, you build 10 meter dish for this, and you can observe fluctuations down to very, very small angular scales. And since you have more coverage in angular scales, you have more lever arm. Then NS is not one, less than one at 3.5 sigma. Good, but not definitive. Then this ESA's Planck satellite came along. Look at this. Just, you know, from this, that's pretty good, to that, marvelous, and this is just spectacular. And with this, you get more than five standard deviations, five sigma, and now we claim the victory. We discovered this, okay? Sorry, I'm not involved in Planck, so I shouldn't say we. But uh, for WMAP, we actually also saw this more than five sigma by combining C and B with other data sets. But this is the first time the cosmic micro background data alone said, and this is not one. This is very, very good evidence for inflation. Okay? But not, not, not enough. Okay? Not sufficient. How do they go further? Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence. Carl Sagan said that very, very well. So now that we observe this thing, uh, density waves, you know, tofu waves, density waves, we want to also see the same thing in gravitational waves. So next frontier is quantum fluctuations generate not only density waves, but also so-called gravitational waves. What are the gravitational waves? Space around me is curved. So uh, Einstein tells you that the gravity is, in fact, a geomet property of a geometry. Earth going around the sun because Earth, Earth is trying its best to go straight. But of course, sun's gravity curves space around it. Earth is tricked. Earth is trying its best to go straight, straight. But it's actually, in fact, because of the curve, curve of the space around the sun due to sun's gravity is going around. So space around me is curved because of that. Now I expand my arms, then spin. Then I change curve, curve the space around me. So it becomes time dependent. I do repeatedly like that. Then this disturbance in space, curve the space propagates outward. This is gravitational waves. And one very good way to detect this gravitational wave is to have a ring of particles in front of you. And gravitational waves are coming toward you. Then particles move like this. And when the uh, 
So basically, when particles are moving outward, space is being stretched. So let's say space is just uh, stretched in a certain, certain direction. When spa space is stretched, wavelength of the light is also stretched. So wavelengths get longer, and photon gets colder. So by simply letting this uh, gravitational wave pass through, we create temperature fluctuations. This can be looked for. So now we have this diagram. This is probably one of the most important diagrams in cosmology today. Horizontal axis is NS I talked about. Vertical axis is the amplitude of gravitational waves. And these uh, contours are exclusion contours. So you want to be inside of these contours. If you're outside, you, you are excluded. Because we haven't found gravitational waves yet, these contours don't close. Now, you don't have to know the details, but the one remarkable thing is that this, uh, there are two black points out, well outside of the contours. These are classic textbook example of how my inflation might happen, so-called five, five to the fourth model. You don't have to know what that is. Only thing you have to know is it's now ruled out, excluded by the data. This is the physics of the universe that was 10 to the minus 36 seconds old, and we're excluding it. This is experimental science that the, the studies early universe, and uh, this is remarkable. Now, inflation, uh, that's right, okay? Now, how do we go move forward? So this is basically the best we can do with temperature and isotropies. Now we want to do polarization. Now, because inflation stretches things by remarkable factor, so 10 to the 26 at least, the wavelength of these gravitational waves is something unimaginable. Billions of light years. So you see these gravitational waves with wavelengths of billions of light years, basically the comparable size of the observable universe today. You are sure that the inflation happened. Now how do we find this? We use polarization, something that we hadn't talked about yet. So light is a wave, and it oscillates in various directions. If you have equal amounts of lights in all the random directions, oscillating directions, you see that light is not polarized. But now you can have a filter that transmits only the light at a particular oscillating direction. Then you can detect polarization. Like this, so you have the fence filter that transmits only the uh, vertical oscillation. Then you, you, can, uh, you can pick up one oscillation. One example is that when you have a reflection of the sunlight by sea, you have the sunlight coming from the above and gets reflected upon the surface of the sea. This light, in fact, is horizontally polarized. Okay? So if you can have sunglasses that transmit only the vertical polarization, you don't see this light. Probably this is more spectacular. So there's some product called polar visor. And these are the polarized sunglasses that transmit only the vertical polarization. Because sunlight that reflected by the windshield of the car is horizontally polarized, if you wear these sunglasses, you can see through the interior of the car. So this is the polarization. So cosmic micro background is scattered by electrons. So they are polarized. OK? And, uh, when you have two modes of the uh, polarization like that, the uh, gravitational waves like that, and then it creates temperature and isotropy. And when this temperature and isotropy is scattered by electron, it creates polarization. This is what we want to see. To search for this, there are many experiments. So South Pole Telescope I mentioned to you. Atacama Cosmology Telescope I mentioned to you. And there's a polar bear experiment in Chile, which is doing precisely this. And of course, Simon's Foundation founded, uh, funded uh, more telescopes for this polar bear experiment. So Simon's Foundation is deeply involved in this wonderful search of polarization due to gravitational waves. And something called BICEP2, uh, led by Harvard University, Minnesota University, Stanford University, and uh, uh, Caltech and JPL. They claim to have found such polarization. Uh, 
that immediately, so March 17th, immediately picked up by media. So Mr. Dennis Overby, New York Times. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Amos, BBC. And I felt somewhat ashamed that this German newspaper doesn't have a signed article on this. Uh, but anyway, this is a big deal. And long story short, sorry, it was, wasn't there. So Mr. Dennis Overby <laughs> wrote that he wasn't there. Mr. Jonathan Amos said sorry, he was wrong. And this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, reporter without a name said in Germany that, uh, sorry, it was an error. OK, so search continues. But uh, because we didn't see this polarization yet from the gravitational waves, now a whole bunch of other models are gone. OK, so rule that, rule that, rule that. So these are the models that you don't have to know. But the only thing you have to know is that we are excluding a hell of a lot in fresh models. Now search continues. And personally, once again, you don't have to know this, but I just have to say it. There's another classic textbook example in inflation called the phi square model, not phi to the four, phi square. This is gone. This is a big deal because every single textbook on inflation teaches inflation by using this model. We're not allowed to talk, talk about this anymore. Yeah? So, so th this is the milestone. This is a big, huge deal for someone working on cosmology. So search continues. Uh, it doesn't have to be a satellite. Okay, let me make it clear. You don't have to go to space to do this. I have every reason to think that the first discovery of gravitational waves polarization will come from the ground, the base experiments. Say, Simon's Array, Polar Bear, Atacama Cosmology Telescope, South Pole Telescope. But eventually we need satellite to make the definitive measurement. Because we want to get most out of the sky. One such uh, satellite project is JAXA, Japan, Lightbird, which I'm deeply involved. Proposal is due next week. <laughs> and we're furiously writing the proposal at the moment in Japanese. Uh, another one is uh, ESA, which, uh, so I'm now in Germany now. So uh, although I'm Japanese helping J uh, JAXA's mission, I'm also helping ESA's mission. This is called CORE. Proposal was sent. One month ago, January 15th, we sent a proposal to it. So fingers crossed. Uh, so let me summarize. Yes, we can observe the physical condition of the early universe using CMB. I hope you're completely convinced of that. Our origin goes back to quantum fluctuations. Thanks to Gaussianity test I mentioned to you, we know this for sure. And S less than one was achieved, and this gives us a strong evidence that the inflation might have happened, but we really need gravitational waves. We need to detect billion light year long gravitational waves to be fully convinced that something like inflation happened. And uh, it may not take so long uh, before we actually see them. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>